Welcome back. Last time I gave you two sentences to translate into hieroglyphs. Let's start with them. The first was, they, in the duel, fared downstream together with her. We all know by now that we start with the verb, to fare downstream. That's ched. Next, we attach our suffix pronoun for they, which is the folded cloth, water sign, and two strokes for the duel. So we have them faring downstream. Now, how do we say together with? Well, that's henna. Finally, it's with her. So we can use the folded cloth suffix pronoun. And that's it. Ched seni henna s. They fare downstream together with her. Good. One more sentence for homework. This land is in joy when you, in the duel, are in the sky. Our verb is is, so we start with you. Now, it's the land that's in joy, so we next add the land ideogram, which was pronounced ta. We have to make sure that we say it's this land, so we need to add the correct this. Ta doesn't end in a T, so it's masculine. That tells us to use pen, the masculine form for this. We also remember that this follows the noun, so we add it after land. The owl is the in, and joy is reshwet. So now we have, this land is in joy. There was another way we could have translated that sentence with almost the same meaning. Can you figure out how? We could have used the verb, resh, to rejoice, and it would have been, the land rejoices. Not exactly the same, but close. Next, we must do the second part of the sentence. The when is understood, so we need the verb is. That's the R. Now, we add the suffix pronoun for you in the dual, which is the same as you plural, but with two strokes rather than three. Cheni. In is the owl, good. And last is sky, pronounced pet. And that's our sentence. This land is in joy when you are in the sky. You ta pen, em reshwet, you cheni, em pet. Good. Now I'd like to do a little grammar with you. First involving suffix pronouns, those hieroglyphs added to nouns for possession, or verbs to show who is doing the action, as in he says. Dejed f. Suffix pronouns can also be used another way, to talk about oneself. This is called reflexive. In English, we say myself, herself, himself, and they're used for emphasis. Rather than just saying, I did it, I might say, I did it myself, for emphasis. This is the primary use of the reflexive. Egyptians didn't have special reflexive pronouns like we do. Often, they just repeated the suffix pronoun for emphasis. For example, look at this sentence. You can translate that. The verb is dejed, to say, or speak, and we have the suffix pronoun viper, which is he. So that's he says. Next, we have the water sign. What do you think it's doing? What does it mean? Well, it's to for people, so he talks to. To whom? Another viper makes it he talks to himself. Sometimes, to emphasize a reflexive, a special word is used, jess. That's used for all kinds of reflexive stuff. For example, ren is name. And the man sign is the suffix pronoun for my. So the serpent folded cloth would give it the sense of my own name. A bit more emphatic. Here's another one. That would be Ray, the sun god, himself. Ray himself. Just remember that the serpent with the folded cloth is reflexive. By now, you're somewhat comfortable with suffix pronouns. You know how to affix them 
to nouns for possession and how to tack them on to the ends of verbs for action. We've even seen that they can be used reflexively. Now I want to show you a different kind of pronoun, the dependent pronoun. Dependent pronouns do not have to be added onto any other word in the sentence. It's not a suffix. They stand alone. Dependent pronouns are usually used as the object of the verb, the thing or person receiving the action. For example, if I said, he sends me, we have two pronouns in the sentence, two words that take the place of proper nouns. We have he and we have me. Now, the he sends part is easy. We've had that before. We start with our verb to send, hob, and then we add the he suffix pronoun, which is the horn viper, hob f. What we haven't had is the me pronoun. This is a dependent pronoun. It's written like this. And as you would expect, it was pronounced we, we. So he sends me would be hob f we. If I wanted to say he sends you, I need a different dependent pronoun for you. If it's a masculine you that he's sending, like his son, then I need the masculine dependent pronoun, chu. So he sends you would be hob f chu. If it's a female you who's being sent, then we need chen. He sends you, but feminine. For him or it, masculine, it's su. So if I'm sending him, it would look like this. For her or it, feminine, it would be say. So it would be hob f say. He sends her. I know that when you see two strokes now, you will think dual. Just remember that once in a while, it's a dependent pronoun. I've been throwing a lot of pronouns at you. In the last minute, you've seen all the singular dependent pronouns there are. Don't be overwhelmed. You will get them. To help the process, make a dependent pronoun chart. Start with I, me. Add the way it's pronounced. Then add you, masculine and feminine. Chu, for feminine, you can have Chen. Then we just need the third person, he and she. He and it would be su. She and it would be se. These are your singular dependent pronouns. This is the kind of chart to use when doing your homework. Look it up. There are also dependent pronouns for plurals. The good news is that they're the same as the suffix pronouns. So, for example, if you wanted to say, you ferry us across, we start with the verb ja to ferry across. Then we add the suffix pronoun for you, which is the basket. So that's the you ferry across part. Now we add the dependent pronoun, which is the same as the suffix in this case, chen. Ja, ke, chen. And that's you ferry us across. If you wanted to say they ferry you in the plural across, how would you do that? Try it now. Take your time. Yes, you would start with the verb, ferry across. Good. Then it's time for the suffix pronoun for they, which is sen. That's the they ferry across part. Now we need the dependent pronoun for you in the plural. It's the same as the suffix pronoun plural for you. Well, that's chen. And that would be they ferry you across. How would you translate the following sentence? Well, there's sending going on, and we see the viper F. So he's sending. Now, whom is he sending? Yes, plural them. We have a bit more translation to go on. In his boat. Hob F Sen M Depit F. Good. Let me give you a few sentences for homework that involve dependent pronouns. 
There's a dependent pronoun chart in our exercise book. But make your own chart for practice, just as we did for suffix pronouns, to use for the homework. First sentence, translate into hieroglyphs. You, singular feminine, send me to him. Next, try you, singular masculine, ferry her across to the city. Good. Dependent pronouns are very useful, and you'll see them often. They are also used after phrases of exclamation, like, behold, which is mech. That's the word for behold. We should add this one to our dictionary. Sometimes the arm hieroglyph will be holding a rounded loaf in its hand. It's the same meaning, behold. After behold, you might see a dependent pronoun. Another similar exclamation that uses dependent pronouns is lo, which is isch, isch. I'll give you an example in a minute, but I want to show you something else and then combine the two in one big example. The something else is a small grammatical note that's related to dependent pronouns. We have seen that the owl has many meanings. From, in. Let me show you one more important use. The ancient Egyptians never simply said something like, you are my scribe. They would use an owl M. We call it the M of predication to say, you are as my scribe. The owl hieroglyph is the as. So if we wanted to translate, you are my scribe, it would be you, which is the R part of the sentence. Then the suffix pronoun for you is the basket, if it's masculine singular. I just picked that one. Right? In English, you is ambiguous. right? It could be you feminine, right? our tethering ring, or it could be you masculine, our basket, or you plural. We just don't know. That's the plural in hieroglyphs. We have words for each. There's no ambiguity in Egyptian. Now for the moment of truth. We insert an owl. That's the as part. Then we add the scribe hieroglyphs. Next, we must add another man sign after scribe because he's my scribe. We don't translate the as. We simply say, you are my scribe. I view the owl of predication as an equal sign. What's on one side, you, equals what's on the other side, my scribe. When the owl of predication is used after one of the exclamation particles, like mech, behold, you don't need a verb. For example, behold, you are my maidservant. We start with behold. Then we go straight to the dependent pronoun for you, which is chen because maidservant is feminine, right? Baquet. Next is the M of predication. Next comes maidservant. Finally, you are my maidservant. So I add the man suffix pronoun for the my, mek chen em baketi. So it's really easy. It's behold, you are as my maidservant. Next. Let's learn the passive voice, not to be confused with the past tense. It's passive voice. Let's look at a simple sentence that's active voice. We would translate this sentence as I hear. Said to me, I'm doing something. I'm hearing. It's active voice. Now, if I insert a loaf and a quail chick between the verb and the subject, it would look like this, sejim tu e. This insertion of the loaf and quail chick forms the passive voice, and we translate it as, I am heard. I'm not hearing, I'm heard. Let's keep going with more examples. That's how you'll learn it. We translate this as, you hear. Let's insert the two, the loaf and the quail chick, between the verb and the subject. This is the passive voice. You are heard. Okay, now you do one. First, do the active voice. How would we say, we hear? We all know we start with the verb. 
Then we add the suffix pronoun for we, which is the water sign with three plural strokes. That's we hear. It's active voice. We're hearing. Now for the passive voice. We are heard. Same verb, same subject. We just insert loaf quail chick. And that's we are heard. It's not difficult. For homework, let me give you a few sentences to translate from hieroglyphs to English. Try this one. It's a good one. The sentence has one word you haven't had yet. Can you pick it out? Yes, it's the one that begins with the arms up, the field goal sign, and ends with the man with a basket on his head. That's the determinative. The word means work, the noun, and was pronounced cut. Now you'll be able to translate the sentence, and I think you'll enjoy it. Here's another. One more hieroglyphs to English sentence. Here it is. Now, let's do three that are English to hieroglyphs. That's where we really learn it. I am sent to the city. Start with that one. Next, they are seen in the river. Next, his daughter is sent to the boat. That should keep you out of trouble for a while. But wait, there's more. It's like the Ginzu steak knives. We've been studying hieroglyphs for a while now, and I'm sure you all agree that hieroglyphs are important. They are part of our world cultural heritage and have been with us for more than 4,000 years. Early on in the course, we talked about how the ability to read hieroglyphs was lost. It was due to a combination of factors. There were foreign invasions, the literate priestly class was not supported, the dominant bureaucratic language of Egypt became Greek, Christianity replaced the old religion and the written script, so finally, the language was lost. In the lectures that followed, we talked about how the language was rediscovered and the ability to read hieroglyphs reborn. We saw that a significant part of this rediscovery was due to Napoleon's Egyptian campaign and the discovery of the famous Rosetta Stone. But Napoleon's artists and savants did far more than just discover the Rosetta Stone. They were copying inscriptions so that future scholars would be able to read them when the code was finally cracked. They were actively working towards the preservation and decipherment of hieroglyphs. As you know, when they returned to France, they published the Description de l'Egypte, the both beautiful and encyclopedic history of Egypt that launched modern Egyptology. I want to show you an original page from that great work. They were making a table of all the hieroglyphs they encountered on the walls of the temples and tombs of Egypt. Now remember, no one could translate hieroglyphs when they were doing this. This was for future scholars. These were gifted artists and scholars working in the middle of a war, one they would lose. They were doing a remarkable job. But sometimes things aren't as they appear. Let me explain. About 30 years ago, I was curator of an exhibition on Napoleon in Egypt at my university's museum. I thought it would be interesting if we created a reconstruction of an ancient Egyptian tomb based on one of the engravings in the Description de l'Egypte. I wanted one with hieroglyphs so my students could, you know, participate in copying the hieroglyphs on the walls of the recreated tomb. Plate number 48 of volume 4 seemed perfect. It had a couple of figures in the front that were decorative and loads of hieroglyphs. The tomb was built and my students began copying inscriptions on the walls. Very soon, one girl came to me and said, Dr. Breyer, Dr. Breyer, we can't translate this. It doesn't make sense. I went over to the wall and quickly saw what was wrong. The students had carefully copied what the savants had written, but it wasn't accurately copied in the first place. So the bird hieroglyphs, and you can see there are plenty of bird hieroglyphs, vultures, falcons, ducks, etc. You know, as you know, 
it's very important which bird you use. If you want to say in or from, you better use the owl. The duck won't do. Or if you're writing Pharaoh's golden horse name, you had better not use a quail chick. But Napoleon Savants didn't know this. Decipherment was more than 20 years in the future, and they still believed it was picture writing. They figured a bird is a bird and just filled in a generic bird whenever there was a bird hieroglyph. After all, it was all picture writing, wasn't it? If they had been able to read the text, they would never have made that mistake. They did, however, begin a new discipline within Egyptology, epigraphy, the copying of inscriptions. The first expedition to copy hieroglyphs that could actually read them was an all-star team composed of French and Tuscan scholars. The French were led by none other than Jean-Francois Champollion, the Tuscans by Ippolito Rossellini. Like Champollion, Rossellini was a linguistic genius becoming a professor of Oriental languages at age 24. In 1824, Rossellini read Champollion's work on decipherment and fell in love with both Egypt and hieroglyphs. The two met when, in 1825, Champollion went to Italy to study an important collection of Egyptian antiquities in Turin. The two young men were kindred spirits and quickly hit it off, with Rossellini happily taking the role of the student. They visited each other frequently, with Rossellini helping Champollion catalog the Louvre's Egyptian collection. While there, Rossellini conceived the idea of a Tuscan expedition to Egypt to extend what the French had done with their Description de l'Egypte. Because his team could read hieroglyphs, he was convinced they could advance the study of Egyptology considerably. Because they couldn't translate the hieroglyphs, Napoleon Savants concentrated on art and temple architecture, not really the hieroglyphs. Often they omitted the hieroglyphs, merely indicating where they'd been by two parallel lines. Remember the scene of Cleopatra giving birth to Caesarian? Well, that block that the savants copied is now lost to history. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they had copied the inscriptions that accompanied the scenes so we could read them today? Rossellini realized all this, and in 1827, asked Grand Duke Leopold II to fund his expedition to Egypt. Leopold agreed. Rossellini was a great scholar in his own right, but wouldn't a joint Franco-Tuscan expedition be even better with the decipherer, as he called Champollion, leading the French team? Champollion had never been to Egypt and enthusiastically agreed to the combined expedition. He had some difficulty getting funding from King Charles X, but in the end, he prevailed. On July 31st, 1828, the expedition sailed from Toulon for Egypt, almost exactly 30 years after Napoleon Savants left the same port for Alexandria, Egypt. For 15 months, the dozen or so artists, Egyptologists, and scholars sailed up and down the Nile, recording everything. One of their goals was to validate Champollion's decipherment of hieroglyphs. You see, in 1828, there were still some linguists who doubted the validity of Champollion's translations. So the teams made a special effort to record inscriptions. When they returned, Champollion and Rossellini planned a joint publication, but it was not to be. Champollion died in 1832 at the age of 41. Champollion's elder brother and executor didn't trust Rossellini with his brother's legacy. So in the end, each team produced its own publication. Because the two teams were working side by side at the same sites in Egypt, often sharing artists, the engravings produced by the Tuscans and the French are often indistinguishable. But they're quite different from the Description de l'Egypte engravings. Like the Description, they produce beautiful color plates of scenes. But they have a different feel. Napoleon's men were mainly engineers and architects. The Franco-Tuscan expedition had professional artists. Another difference is that these guys could translate the hieroglyphs. They knew that an owl and a quail chick were not interchangeable. They spent days accurately copying lines and lines of hieroglyphs, which can be read today as easily if you were in Egypt in front of the wall. This marvelous expedition set the ball rolling 
for accurate and professional copying of hieroglyphic inscriptions. Let me end by telling you about a remarkable program going on now to save hieroglyphic inscriptions on temple walls. The epigraphic survey of the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute has been quietly copying hieroglyphic inscriptions for more than 75 years. It's a massive program involving hundreds of extremely talented scholars and very few people know about their efforts. Let me tell you just what they're doing and how they're doing it. More than 100 years ago, the great American Egyptologist James Henry Breasted realized that the hieroglyphic inscriptions on temple walls were in danger of being lost. Inscribed temple blocks were being looted for local construction. Some were stolen to sell on the illegal antiquities market. And some were just in poor condition and crumbling. Breasted set out on an incredible one-man campaign to translate every historical inscription in Egypt. It sounds like an overly ambitious plan, but he almost did it. For decades, he camped out at temples, translating the inscriptions on their walls. In the end, he published a monumental five-volume set of his translations called Ancient Records of Egypt. It's a remarkable legacy. But he left us even more. Breasted convinced John D. Rockefeller that the temples of ancient Egypt were endangered and their inscriptions had to be accurately copied by a team of trained Egyptologists. Rockefeller agreed and provided money to build a compound in Luxor, Egypt, near the main monuments, to house what we come known as the Epigraphic Survey. For more than 90 years, successive teams of scholars have lived at Chicago House, as the compound's called, recording inscriptions. Everyone in Egyptology agrees that no one has ever made more accurate copies of hieroglyphic inscriptions than this team. The remarkable accuracy is due to a combination of their skills and the unique method they've developed over decades. Each epigrapher is both a talented artist and an Egyptologist who can translate hieroglyphs. Unlike Napoleon's savants, these people can read what they're copying. In addition, their exacting method almost guarantees accuracy. First, the section of the wall that's being recorded is photographed with a large format camera. Then enlargements are made on a special paper that can take an ink or pencil line. Next, the epigrapher takes the photograph to the temple wall and begins copying on top of the photograph all the carved details he sees on the wall. He copies what he sees onto the photograph because there are some details that can only be caught by the human eye and some that would be caught only by the camera. This combination of photo and drawing is often confusing when first viewed. It contains not only the ancient carvings, but also all the cracks and discolorations in the stone. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate between a carved line and a crack, especially if the block is damaged and eroded. But the next step takes care of that and it's magic. The inked photograph is immersed in an iodine bath that dissolves away the photographic image, leaving just the ink drawing that has been made with the help of the photograph beneath it. This ink drawing of the wall is not the final product. It's now taken back to the wall for comparison, and corrections are made in pencil. A second epigrapher checks the corrections, and the two come to a final agreement. An artist makes the final corrections, and this is shown to the field director, who checks it one more time at the wall. The work of Chicago House team has become urgent. Since the creation of the new high dam at Aswan in the 1970s, the water table in Luxor has risen considerably. This groundwater saturated the foundation stones of the temples and was being wicked upward by the blocks higher up, causing sandstone to crumble. In my lifetime, I've seen walls that I could read easily deteriorate so much that they're now unintelligible. The work of Chicago House is a race against time. This year, the team has been aided by new digital technology. They're now able to photograph the walls, load the photographs onto a computer, and then ink the reliefs and hieroglyphs on the computer using a stylus. Then they digitally bleach the photo away, leaving the clear, clean drawing of the wall. 
We're all betting, benefiting in many ways from the work of this dedicated team. All of Chicago House's work is available digitally on the Oriental Institute's website, and it's free. If you want a hard copy, the massive volumes are available for purchase. Some of the homework I've given you comes from the Oriental Institute's publications. Soon, we'll be translating a section of a wall at Medina Habu. So when you do your homework today, think of Chicago House team working at some temple wall in Luxor. I'll see you next time.